that is? Discipline. Selfish. No joke. We're legitimate. Yeah, fucking do this. Then do it. Do it 100%, because I'm trying to. We recognize that we are limitless. You gotta be a champion, become a champion, right? Winning is a habit because we create habits that lead to good execution and success. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mike Bianca. I coach the New Orleans Hurricanes. This is my friend and co host of the Coaches Show, Ryan Gray, he coaches AC Diesel. And first of all, I wanna Thank you all for wanting to participate in this. It makes us, uh, it's good to see that there are people who are interested in the aspect of paintball. That's something that Ryan and I are really trying to push and promote. There's not a lot of emphasis and materials for coaches out there, right? A lot of us have had to learn this and create this and do this on our own. There's no, no handbook on it, there's no guide, right? But coaching is coaching. There are several aspects of coaching that we can take from other sports and apply to our own, right? So that's what we're gonna to try to do. One thing I do wanna establish early on, if you are already an established coach or you've been coaching for some time or at a particular level, you may not get a lot out of what we're gonna do here, right? And let me explain. This is gonna be very much a basic introduction principle presentation, right? These are some of the things that you wanna understand before you take on this role of coach, right? And then, but that being said, at the end of it, we are going to open it up to questions. And if we really want to get into depth and really get into some things a little bit more detail from there, please feel free to ask the questions. Well, I promise you, uh, if we don't know the answer, I'll just point it right. Um, so, uh, but again, thank you. So, coaching, paintball. Why? <laughs> Who would ever want to do that? All right. And it's a question you got to ask yourself. So what are some of the, let's start off with something we need to understand before we take this endeavor. What are some attributes, some things you should probably have in the, in the tool belt in order to be successful, to see success, right? So what kind of, uh, what are you bringing to the table to make you a good coach, to be the best for your team, right? So a uh, philosophy I have, and. I'll just start off real quick, Ryan, and I'll let you roll into maybe one of the attributes. I don't believe that there's one gear. There is not one gear for a coach, right? One of the, the key components of a coach, and maybe stop me if you've heard this, I should not, the player should not have to learn how I coach, okay? I should coach the way my players learn, right? So, one of the number one attributes you need to bring to the table is you better be a good communicator. You better be able to explain what you want, why you want it, and how, okay? I'm not gonna talk to a Drew Bell, he's a player on my team, the same way I'm gonna talk to a Jacob Seawright or a Stuart Ridgell or a Daniel Kemp. That's gonna be your second attribute that you probably need to bring to the table. There's gonna be a minor in psychology you should probably have. Understand that I've got to know my players. I gotta know, hey, is mama homesick? How's the baby doing? How's work, right? Now, a lot of y'all are probably thinking, why is that important? Because that's gonna affect where their mindset is when they come to the practice field. And that's really important as a coach. You gotta understand how my guy, what he's dealing with, because that's how you're gonna get the most out of him. And you're also gonna recognize the fact that if I understand my player and I understand what's going on in his life outside of paintball, then I should be able to know how to reach him, how to talk to him, how he responds, right? He or she, sorry. How they respond to what I'm wanting to do, what I'm asking them to do. You gotta build that trust, right? <clears throat> I'm not your friend, I'm your coach. And that doesn't mean a coach doesn't care. You gotta care. It's kind of important. Because if you don't, you're, they're not gonna care either. 
And if none of us are caring about the whole thing, well, then we're not going to get any production. Okay? Now, I know I've kind of rattled off a couple of different things. Uh, if I move too fast, if Ryan and I move too fast, stop us. Say, hold up, coach. Back up. Why would you say that? So don't. By the way, I also want to establish one other thing. There's no dumb questions. There's no stupid questions. Just stop me at any point. The dumbest question is the one not asked. There are, however, stupid people. Yeah, right. Agreed. That's Be 100%. Clear. Um, so I, I've talked about to some of the attributes to have. You've got to have trust. You've got to have communication. You've got to have psychology. Did you want to finish out our list? Yeah, what are some others you guys think are important? If, and, and think about this is not just about paintball, right? right? Choosing your players who are fundamentally sound. Say that one more time. Choose players that are fundamentally sound. Well, it depends on the level of your group, right? Which is what we're going to talk about next time, yep. right? Or in the next little segment. But what are some other attributes you think it's important to have as a coach? Integrity. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Right? Character, which includes integrity, is critical. If I expect my players to be on time, should I be on time? Yeah, of course. If a player um, asks me for critical advice, I should probably tell it straight, not bullshit around about it, right? Tell them what they're asking. Don't make them have to sift through the nonsense to get to the point, right? If I'm not honest in my feedback, am I ever going to get an honest performance? No. Yeah, that's great. What else? Experience. Experience, maybe, right? Possibly. So some great tools now that exist, right, when we think about experience is uh, understanding of the game maybe, right? Like to be a coach, if I'm a um, semi-pro coach, right, should I have probably at least played maybe and have experience at the semi-pro level? Maybe, right? There are some great, um, there have been great coaches, you know, Paul Richards, maybe Paul the, Richards. the greatest coach ever, didn't really play at a high level, but he knew how to connect with players, right? He had a tremendous amount of experience as a coach, coaching at different ranks. In my opinion, he's the best coach paintball's ever seen. Agreed. So, right. experience for sure. What else? Yeah. Compassion? Passion, period, right? Yeah, I was. I, but yeah, definitely I was compassion. compassion. So, understanding how to uh, talk to your players, like, well, I want to um, kind of add something to Mike said. Those are all really good. Thank you. One of the things Mike talked about was understanding your players away from the field and things that can be happening. That also kind of depends on the level of people you're coaching, right? So, if you have young kids, um, you do need to really understand what's going on with them for sure, right? Um, and I, I watch coaches. Uh, and I've seen it for years, and maybe even at times been that coach myself, where I have allowed my kind of intensity and passion uh, to override logic, right? And, and not had grace for the person I was talking to, and maybe turn some people away from paintball. Maybe, right? I've seen people, uh, coaches, uh, yell and approach a player who made a mistake at practice, at practice, made a mistake at practice, and demean and belittle them, is that helpful? Maybe. It depends, depends on the player. On the player. <laughs> right? Because if that player loves a hard coach, maybe. Maybe. Maybe they love that. They're mildly masochistic. Maybe they enjoy that. Right? But usually, the best way to, do, um, to have correction, especially at practice, why do we practice? Why do we practice? Make mistakes, make mistakes, right? Like one of the first things I tell my guys when we're going into practice is make a lot of mistakes, especially on day one. Make a tremendous amount of mistakes. Find all the seams you can, run around like idiots, right? Try everything, make tons of errors. Now day two, it gets a little bit different. By day three, it gets dramatically different, right? But even on day three, my approach is usually, hey, that was good, what you did. And then I'll ask, tell me what you were thinking because I want to fix your brain, right? But then, hey, maybe this way would be better. Like, what you did is good, but I think this would be a better option, right? Or I'll say, hey, what you did, that wasn't great. Let's try it this way, right? Especially if I understand that that player may be dealing with something at home, right? And I also might be able to tell his teammates, hey, man, take it easy. Take it easy. Don't, don't destroy that guy today. He needs some grace, right? So level of your group. Understanding, like, the first thing we have to do as a coach, especially if you're jumping into a new team, and I've done this multiple times. I've, I coached uh, the Naughty Dogs in 2006 and then X Factor in 2007 and 8 through their very first uh, inaugural, inaugural professional season, then recreated Texas Storm in 2010 and took that team pro, coached Austin Notorious in 2021 through 2023 from Division II to pro, 
and then now jumping into yet another group. So I've had to start with new groups a lot, right? So the first thing I have to do is evaluate my group. Where are we at? What kind of talent are we looking at? You mentioned uh, understanding skill level, right? I might have some, some guys who play at a 10, right? Rarely, never, really, let's be honest. Nobody's ever playing at a 10, otherwise they break out, shoot five guys off the break and go to the house, right? That's never gonna happen. So I might have guys playing at a seven, maybe two or three, but then I have other guys playing at a three or four, right? I gotta get the guys to a three or four up to the sevens, right? Without bringing the guys to a set that are playing at a seven down. So there's, a, there's um, it's tough to sometimes an, a, analyze that and get it right. It's tough and it's taken a lot of experience to be able to do that. You have some resources, right? If you have professional coaches, uh, sorry, professional players around your area, it's always a good, a good idea to lean on those guys. They're helpful, right? If you have some other coaches of professional teams, uh, there's several of us who are also really helpful. We wanna uh, bring up the next group of players. Mike does a ton of stuff in his area. I do quite a few things in Oklahoma around me. Uh, Ryan Brand does quite a few things down in San Antonio. SK coaches a lot. Uh, out in California. There, there's a handful of coaches who are helpful all the time. Joey Blute uh, does quite a few things around Florida. Uh, lean on one of those folks if you're looking at a group and you want to develop a team to help you kind of analyze where you are. There's another way to do it, by the way. Does anybody know the other way? What's that? Yeah, that doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't. I, I just experienced that. <laughs> What's the other way? Sign up for a tournament. If we're talking about a tournament paintball team and you want to evaluate your level, sign up, right? So does it matter what my APPA number is? Like what my ranking is on APPA? What does it matter for? It does. What does it matter for? It only matters in what division I can sign up for, right? So if my total points equal X, right, and I don't have a player over a certain level, I can sign up for whatever that is, right? Let's say it's D4. If I think my group or I don't know if my group is D4, but we can sign up for D4, and that's the lowest we can sign up for. Where should we sign up? D3. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but see, but no, that's actually... All right, what's your interesting name? Point. i got to write that down. <laughs> <laughs> that's an interesting point, though, right? I, I'm going to segue real quick. Yeah, yeah, please. First of all, I want to hold that thought. I want to go back. Someone else said patience on one of the attributes. Ooh. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, you better have it, okay? Because they're going to have certain... In any type of sport where you're dealing with multiple people, you're going to be dealing with multiple personalities. Some personalities are in one person. So um, you got to recognize that. Sometimes it's the coach. Um, but yes, patience is very good. I'm a firm believer that these, there's a cancer in, in paintball where these teams will sit there and they'll be like, well, we're all ranked D4, but let's go play D1. I don't, I don't understand Sorry. it. I don't get it, right? And the reason why I don't, why are we not, these teams that'll sit there and they'll compete in D4 and they'll get ninth, 10th, whatever, regionally. Okay, let's jump up to, let's jump up now. Well, did you win? Did you win an event in D4? Now, I'm not saying that you can't do it. There are teams that legitimately weren't winning events, but they were always in the hunt. And that kind of makes sense. And they figured, okay, we're gonna take that next step to in our evolution to grow and see where we stand since that's where we want to be and i get that but these big leaps and these big jumps win where you are at he was talking about the fact that we should manage actually this is a great segue into managing expectations this let me is, finish before you move yeah, on go to ahead. Manage, though so <clears throat> if we're unaware of like what the level of our group is we sign up for an event right and we sign up at the lowest level we can sign up for that's where we sign up yep and then we go play that event and if we win Maybe we move up, maybe. If we don't win the division uh, for the year, the series, and again, I'm, uh, I know we're at just coming off of an NXL, but I'm not talking about NXL. If you're creating a team, don't come to the NXL. Don't. Don't play here. You have local tournaments around you, hopefully, and if you don't, there's plenty all around the country that offer many divisions, sometimes all the way down to D6, three-man, and youth, and everything. Don't start here. Don't ever start here. Is that enough emphasis? Don't ever Don't do start it. here, Don't right? Do this is not where you start. No. You start regionally and locally, and that's where you test your, your chops, right? And again, if you're playing locally 
and D4 and you're not winning, don't come to World Cup and play D4 with expectations to win. Right? That was a really expensive practice. It's, it, and and it, it, it also, just so you understand, it dilutes the division, which hurts every team in the division. If you don't understand that, ask me later and I'll explain. It's bad. I'll explain it right now. And I'm sorry if I offend anybody. Latin Saints. Yes. It's a great the example. Latin Saints gave whatever, whatever bracket they landed in, gave those other four teams an unfair advantage in the hunt to move on to Sunday. They're almost guaranteed a four point or greater uh, margin. Which means three of the teams playing on Sunday came out of that pool every single time, right? So it just, it, it also pulls away from the legitimacy. And I'm not talking about professional paintball, right? I'm just talking about all the divisions, general. right? So start at your local level, right? Once you get to your local event and you play, cause here's the other thing that'll happen. And again, I just experienced this so I can speak all day about it and pretty intensely is your team will look different at a tournament than it does at practice. <laughs> your team will look different, right? You will learn a lot of things. I'm really good at what I do, but in 10, event, or in 10, pra 10 days of practice in one event, I didn't do a very good job, right? I didn't do a very good job. And you'll learn a lot when you get to that first event because things change. You get to take the temperature of your pit, which is also going to show all those character things we talk about, your group, right, which we'll talk about team personality later. But you're going to get to see a lot of the character of your group when you get to an event. When shit hits the fan, how did they react? How did they treat one another when that happened? Did you have players coming in with the fingers all pointed away from them, right? And you're going to, Mike mentioned cancer, right? Not just in paintball itself, but on your team, you're going to learn really quickly who that is. And you might have more than one. You might have more than one. That doesn't mean that they can't be coached and it can't be fixed because they may not have been made aware. Maybe their parents didn't smack them around enough. You get to do that. So another attribute, we didn't talk about this earlier, is you need to understand how to be a mentor. Yeah. It's not just about developing paintball players. It's about developing young men and young women. Absolutely. There have been multiple times throughout my paintball life, and I hear it now, right? They didn't necessarily appreciate it sometimes at the time, but now I get it. I just saw Gerald Garcia. I don't know if some of you guys probably don't even know who that is, but Gerald played with me on Texas Storm in 2001, two, and three, and then went to play for Bob Long's Ironman and hugged me two weeks ago and told me thank you, not for the paintball stuff, for the life stuff. Made me misty, right? I was like, oh man, right? You need to understand how to be a mentor. Your players are gonna have challenges, and if you're experienced, they're gonna want your help, right? So, when you know, where, here's where my group sits, right? We're a D4 team, right? What are the things that we need to develop as a D4 team? What's the next step in the process? You measure your deficiencies, right? And how you do that is you collect a little data and we're done, I'll show you guys some sheets that I use. So at an event, I have a sheet that I call plays on that has an initial for every player on my team, right? So down the left side of the sheet, I've got all these initials and then I write their initial on the sheet, I tell them what they're doing. And then I have three symbols that I use that I put around the player. A circle means you got shot off the break. A box means you got shot out of your spot. And a triangle means you failed the job I told you to do. Okay? And then when I get done, and I also have a place down at the bottom where I put how many players did we shoot off the break? How many of us die off the break? Right? And then what was the time of the match? Okay? That helps me measure my deficiencies. Now, this is as a group. Not as an individual player, that's where the circles, squares, and triangles come from, right? I'm sorry? <laughs> oh, no, no. There's a lot of math in what There's we do for sure. There's a lot of math. So I pull then at the end of the event, I take all of my sheets, I put them together, and I create probability, right? I look at how many, how many times when I send a player to X spot, X spot, and X spot, did they get shot off the break? And then, what was our plus minus on how many people we lost off the break versus what, how many we shot off the break? If I'm negative, what does that mean? I may have two problems. What are they? Wrong. Yep, two things. <laughs> One of two things, or maybe both. What does it mean? Paint. What? Like you're not shooting people off the break? Yeah. No, I either have, we're not very good off the break shooting, or as a coach, did I send you to the wrong damn spot? Right? So just to be clear, those evaluation sheets I do, they're not just for the player. They're for me. 
right? What's my job at a tournament? It's just to manage the game, right? Because the coaching part's over. But at a tournament, my job is to manage the game, which means I got to put my guys in five spaces that they can be alive and let's kill at least one person off the break. That's my job. So if we're negative, we lost more people than we shot, I got to look at, did I send them to the wrong damn spaces, right? Did I send you to the wrong spot? And then if I feel confident, because I go back and look, I also keep track of where everybody else went. By the way, I have somebody else who does that. I don't really do both by myself. But I go back and look at where they went. If they were making the same spots that we were getting shot out of most of the time, what's my problem? No, no, no. If the other team was making it to the same spots my guys were dying out of, what is my problem? Shooting off the break, right? So how do we shoot off the break? How do we, how do we learn how to do that? We do drills. Where do we find drills to do those things? Where? Ask Daniel Camp. Ask Daniel Camp. That's right. Find That's a pro right. player in your area, right? I mentioned that earlier. You do have resources, right? I do. You do Daniel have resources. Camp's a great one. Yeah. yeah, he's kind of a knucklehead and he's eh, at PayPal. He's got a pretty good um, coach, though. But nonetheless, there are resources available, but they're scarce, right? You either have to find a pro player, you have to know somebody who's been around a long time who was a good player. They don't have to be a pro today. Everybody understand that? They don't even have to be uh, semi pro, whatever today. If they were pretty good back in the day and they understand what the hell they're doing, that's probably a really good resource for you, right? Because the, the, the mechanics haven't really changed all that much, right? There's one other really good resource. Online base, what's it called? BKI. Anybody know what BKI is? Yeah. Does anybody use BKI? Yeah, thank you. Good. It's amazing, it right? Is. You can literally, once you identify what your deficiencies are, if you don't know the drill and you don't want to reach out to one of us or another person, go get BKI. Go get it. You can literally type in shooting off the break drills and a whole bunch of videos are going to come up. From a whole a bunch. Of great people. By the way, you can treat them like they're your own if you'd like. You don't have to say, hey, I got these from BKI. You can sound real smart if you want. Got it? There's resources out there available, okay? So then what do we do? You're asking me? I'm yeah, we, we're gonna implement now what we've worked on. Oh, okay. Right? So I didn't know where we were going. We're gonna implement what we've worked on now and then we're gonna measure the result again, right? When do we stop measuring the results? Never, right? Because are we ever pulling up off the box and shooting five people off the break? I've never seen it, have you? Yeah, so are we perfect yet? No, so we never stop measuring the results. So once you know what your starting point is and you create your building blocks, and when I talk about building blocks, what I mean is you, don't you, you have a plan, right? Here's where we are, here's where we wanna get, here's the pathway we're gonna take to get there. It's gonna change, right? It's gonna change because maybe your team picks up shooting off the break really quickly, but they start to fail at communication, right? It's like, okay, we plugged that hole, now we got this hole, right? And then, okay, now we kind of got the, by the way, that one never gets plugged. Yeah, <laughs> it just gets, by the way, communication. It gets fixed a little, yeah. right? It's Everybody's fixed. always working on communication just at multiple different levels, right? But maybe you fix a few things over here and now you have a new problem that's over here. And as you go up divisions, you'll never stop having problems. You will always have deficiencies. You will always have a player who rotates out and a new player comes in. It right. may happen every year. You may have multiple players coming in and out, which is incredibly challenging, right? I have a, I have a question for the room. Um, if you're a coach and you're coaching, or even if you're not a coach, you're thinking about coaching, what division is your team right now? Uh, how many D5? Okay, D4, D3. We have D4 and 5. Okay. D4 and 5. D2? I'm in between D2 and 7. Really Roger that. Awesome. So, all right. So, I'm, I assume there's, other than you, there's probably no other potential semi pro. All right. So, let's, it's a great segue into what he was just talking. We've kind of, we've kind of been hitting you with a lot, right? Just kind of flowing into thought. Let's, one thing I think a good segue into this is managing expectations as a coach, right? We talked about practice and we got into practice. Okay, so there's two things that need to happen every time we decide to have practice with our team. One, goal setting. Every practice has an agenda. A good coach is gonna prepare his team for what he wants to accomplish that day. And we're gonna show you an agenda 
Uh, All right. Uh, before I'm, we leave. I'm kind of very retentive about that stuff. I'm, I, get, I get into the details. I like the minutia. If the coach can, can focus on the minutia, and we'll get into this a little bit later too, one of the key components of a coach is to let his team focus on playing paintball. All right? So one of the aspects we didn't touch on, on one of the attributes, you want to be able to put your players in positions to succeed. How do we do that? We remove obstacles. What's an example of an obstacle? Hey, coach, where are we staying and when are we all getting there and what time are we doing all this, blah, blah, blah. Guys, don't worry about that. I already took care of it. We're going to be staying here at this hotel. We all land in this car. We all do this. Well, get the logistics out of the way. As soon as you can, get that stuff off their plate. Right? Hey, have you booked your flight yet? Yes? No? Get it done. Get this stuff off their plate well in advance. Why? So that when we're preparing for the event, the only thing we're focused on when we get to practice is preparing for the event. We're not worrying about this other stuff that you know, is going on in the background. And it sounds simplistic. Is that really significant? Absolutely. Trust me on this one. Remove those obstacles if you can. Now, back to practice. Hang on, like, though. Pull that really quick down to like a D4 level. So right. maybe we're not booking flights, what are we doing, right? So since the majority of the, you, you in the room, and you've been doing this a really long time, so you understand how silly some of these things can be. What, what are some of the things you guys deal with? Carpool. Carpool, Carpool. right? What else? Yeah. Yeah. Guy shows up at the, at the event, what does he never have? A gun or a oh, good God. Right. Batteries. But, yeah, that one, right? Batteries. Batteries. What else? Cleats. Where are my cleats? Yeah. Right? Um, what? So, what you do is you, oh, create a, yeah. you create a checklist, yeah. right? And I send That's my... That's what I was talking Even the pros do this. Yeah. All right? Hey, boy, hey guys, did you check the, the weather? looks like it's going to be this. Everyone got your rain gear? You got your rain lids? You got your visors? Right? You got appropriate clothing? You know, you know, everyone's got what you need. Everyone go check this now. And you do that a week ahead. <laughs> and then you hit them two days later. Hey, did everyone do your checklist? Sound off. Right? Okay. So that's one. So back to practice, and excellent point, Ryan. So we get to practice. I set goals. There's something I want to work on. Even, even the pros, I make my guys do fundamental work mm. all the time, OK? Here's the thing. It, it, there's some interesting statistics, right? And people think that once the pros have gotten down laning or they've gotten down snapshot, no, we still do that. We're still going to lane. I'm going to shoot. Each, play, each one of my players is going to shoot a case just shooting at a static target. Now, as I've coached up through the, the ranks, this, those static targets went from this big to this big, right? Aim small, miss small. So we'll, we'll talk about that. But always have a goal. Hey, today, guys, I really want to emphasize communication. So we're going to do a bunch of bingo drills. Now, some of you are probably were wondering, what's a bingo drill? I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom on that one. A bingo drill is we're going to break out, and no one is against an opponent. We're going to play paintball, and no one is allowed to make a secondary move until someone yells bingo. And the person who yells bingo is the guy who knows where all five bodies are. And then he, everyone else shuts up and listens to the guy give the bingo call. And then here's the thing. If he gets the bingo right, no one does push-ups. Now, that's my little disciplinary thing that I add. That's not necessary, but uh, that's why all my guys have swole chests. <laughs> but um, um, no, on a serious note, that's a bingo drill. So that's something we might do on a communication thing. Or we might run island drills. How many knows what an island drill is? OK, so basically it's a three on three. I've got two snake way on one side and one on the Dorito. But catty corner to that, now I have two on the Dorito side on this side and one on the other. And the concept is very simple. Crossfield comms and working together to bully guns Right? So I might do that. The goal for the day is communication. We're going to do a bunch of communication stuff. I don't care if you're shooting people. I don't care if you're doing that. We're going to do a bunch of comps. Hey, today we're doing fundamentals. And here's, here's our circuit. <laughs> and I'll have a circuit written out. We, for this hour, from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m., we're doing nothing but snapping. From 8 a.m. to 9 a.m., we're doing nothing but laning. And then I'm really going to get me. We're going to start doing box drill. And basically what I love to do is wear them out for the first four hours. I wear them out. I get them fatigued. Then I play points at the end of the day. 
because that's where the deep water is, right? That's where champions are made, right? We want to make sure they got clear heads when they're playing. So these are just some, this is just some of the things I do, right? I'm just giving you an example on that. But have a goal. Set goals every practice. Every time you step out on the field, every time you're out there with your guys, even if you're out there with half your team, if you know that certain people are going to make it and it's an off weekend drill, not everybody can make it, hey, well, let's go out and shoot some, okay, fine. Have a goal. What are we going to focus on, right? And as a coach, that's the other skill set you need to have. You need to recognize strengths and weaknesses of your team. Because ultimately, as a coach, you're going to leverage those strengths and weaknesses of your team against a layout. And as you progress into the upper divisions, you will now be leveraging those strengths and weaknesses against a layout and against a specific opponent. Tendencies are a pooch. Statistics. Math. I guess that's all paintball is. There's a word for what Mike is talking about with practice. Anybody know what it is? It's intentional. It's intentional. Normally when teams show up to practice, what do they do? What? Play, play point. Yeah, they go over, they get their stuff out, high five in, you know, they're drinking their coffee, right? And they walk out and they go stand on the box and then somebody blows the whistle and goes, you guys ready? Go in five. And they go and they break out and they play the point and they, whatever. And then they tell war stories for the next 20 minutes. It happens, they come off, right? There's zero conversation. They all walk off. Right, or they get shot off in singles or pairs or however the point works out, and they walk off, they go over to the side, they grab a few pods, they stick them back in their pack, they strap up, they go out. Repeat rinse. Is that Repeat. practice? What is that? It's a fun, fun day. So when people show up to your paintball field to play recreationally, what do they do? They go out, they get a pod, right, maybe. You give them a, harness, a little pouch maybe with a couple pods in it because you really like selling paintballs if you're a field owner. I was one, so I get it. Yeah. They give them a little pod pack, they go out with their Tipman or whatever your rental gun is, they go out, they play a point, a game. You give them some sort of scenario, they'll go out. They either accomplish it or they don't, they really don't care, right? They walk off, they're smiling, they tell a few war stories, they go fill a pod, they put it back, put it right back in their pod, they go out and they play another thing. What is the difference between the two? Well, one's gonna be really expensive. <laughs> right? Because they're going to shoot a lot more paint, right? One's going to be really expensive because they're going to shoot a lot more paint. The other one, they're, they're, intention, they're actually the, the, the recreational player who's doing what they came to do. They're intentional about their purpose. The one who's really getting the benefit is the recreational player. They came to have fun, right? They're the ones playing with intention. The tournament player who's practicing, there's no intention. There's no focus, there's no direction. They're going out and just, they're just playing. They're going through motions. And yeah. paintball isn't about going through motions. Paintball, paintball's a ballet. Right? Tournament paintball. Tournament paintball's a ballet. Yeah. You've heard the term chess with guns, right? And I've had people try to debunk that. Good luck. Because it is, right? It's about putting assets in position, right, that ultimately lead to an attrition win. Correct? Everyone agree? Okay. All right. So if we're looking at it from that perspective, then we need to understand survivability on the break. So coach is something you need to be tracking, right? Survivability and break like Ryan was talking about. Uh, kills on the break, um, tendencies. These are all different things you'll track and he'll show you one of these, the ways he does it and I'll do it as well. But ultimately have a goal because the goal is to make your team better, right? So always have a goal, have an agenda. Um, manage expectations too. This is something that I started to touch on earlier. We want to manage the expectations of the day. I want to manage the expectations of my players. I got, I have this great player. I mean, he is an incredible, he wasn't here for this event. Could have really used him. Yeah, it's not Daniel Camp for it's, sure. It's, yeah, Daniel Camp. But his name, uh, well, I'll just say, it. his name's Aaron Pate. And Aaron Pate is an anchor. He's what I call a Swiss Army knife for the team, okay? What Aaron Pate does to this day, and I think he does it intentionally because he knows it gets under my skin. I'm also the godfather to his daughter, so anyway, it's love. But um, he will sit there and go, why are we doing this? This is dumb. Well, if I was a real coach, I would have hit him. But anyway, what I, that's a joke, everyone calm down. No, honestly, here's the thing, he's asking, he's asking a question. If your player does not understand why you're doing something, I failed. Right? I failed in my communication to this player to help him understand the purpose and goal. 
right? So um, he'll ask, why are we doing this? And I love it when he does it now because it gives me an opportunity to manage expectations. We're doing this because you suck at this right now. Well, okay. <laughs> you know, or some of us suck at this right now. This is why Mike and I are a good balance because my approach to that is totally different. Yeah, he would have cut Aaron Pate. If no. It was, it was, no, I wouldn't have. But I would have said, hey, listen, you selfish asshole. You're really good at this. But by the way, this guy isn't. And stop thinking about just yourself. Be Bingo, a teammate. I like that. That's actually pretty right? good to use that. Now, again, our deliveries are totally different. <laughs> right? I've never uh, been accused of, of being soft in my approach or delivery. I'm not which is part of the reason I'm, I've been successful as a coach. For the record, I'm, I'm not tough. soft either. No, <laughs> but your delivery is different, yeah. right? It's different, but it's part of what I was talking about early. Having an understanding of where that intention needs to be isn't just around the group, right? I, again, with, if, I, if I have sevens and threes, I don't want my sevens to go down, but I also, I, I need to bring those threes up and my sevens need to be good enough leaders to understand hey, you're good at this, but maybe he isn't. So this drill that we're doing makes the team better. It's not all about you, right? Because I get it. I get it. I have maybe the most athletic player ever to play this game on my team right now. But he's also maybe the best teammate I've ever seen. Oh, that's right? powerful. That's powerful. Alex Goldman is an amazing teammate. Amazing. He's not the guy that when we do a drill, if I do a snake drill, do you think Alex needs it? Do you think he needs it? No. But you know what he does? 110%. He goes down, does it perfectly, and then walks over and says, is there anything I need to do different? And then we'll stand behind every player that does it and coach them and encourage them the entire time. Right? He's a player who gets it. You know what made Kobe Bryant great? He made everybody else around him great. There it is. Right? So when we understand where the level of our group is, right, and we create intentional practices mm -hmm. and we've managed expectation about what does our process look like, hey, we're going to go play this event. We've now played a D4 event. We got fifth, mm -hmm. right? There were 12 teams. We got fifth place. What's the expectation we're trying to manage now? We don't want to do worse than fifth. We go back to the event, right? We go back to an event in that same series. What's, what's the expectation now? Maybe, right? Let's, let's at least, let's improve, let's move right? The so if there's only 10 teams, do we think a 20% improvement is appropriate? It may depend on what the quality of our practice is and how intentional we are through the process, right? And it also kind of depends on your group and how hungry they are. But managing expectations means you as the leader and the coach have to look at the group and say, hey, you haven't worked hard enough. We're probably not gonna do well. So our micro goals are going to be these. Go and here's, here's why this is important, everyone. I mean, how many of you practice with your teams on weekdays? Oh, I love it. You, you lucky man. Anyone else? OK, most of us are limited to weekends, correct? Because the amount of time we are necessary in order to get everybody together logistically and, and do what we do. So your time with your team is quite important. Important. So it's about the quality, not the quantity. I wish I had my guys all week. We'd be much better. Um, and a budget. If I had a budget, we'd be great. But anyway, um, i got to quit telling people that. So the reason why this is important is because, like you said, if we, if we have our goals set, we've got good time management, we can really work with our teams and really focus on the things that we need to be focusing on. So if I already know what I need to be working on with the team before I get there, then boom, we're off to the races. We're going to be efficient with our time. Because honestly, the time between the nets, and ultimately me as a coach, this is, I'm a little bit different than most, I think, in the fact that I'm, I care more about my guys uh, succeeding outside the net right, than I do inside the net. Because I feel that if, if, they're, if they succeed outside, they're going to be they're going to be in the mental state to where they can give me 150% inside the net and they're ready to go and rock. So, um, so managing expectation, goal setting, time management. Here's something I want to talk to you guys about, especially the D5, D4 teams, right? Culture. I will preach on this till I die and how important culture is. What is going to be your team identity? Does anyone know what I'm talking about when I talk about team identity? Sir. 
I had a team for 14 years, and our whole goal was to be ambassadors of baseball. That's a good identity. Okay. It's a humongous amount of sponsorship was available for that at the time. Yes, sir. The different it worked time. out very well. I kept four of you know, we never had a roster bigger than seven, but four of us were the same the whole way through. Outstanding. It's a good it, ambassadors to paintball. I like that. That's good. That's a great example. I'm glad you're in the room. See, what is your team identity going to be? Is your team identity going to be the good guy? Are you going to be the bad guy? Paintball's got a lot of bad guys. That's easy, right? Or maybe, maybe it's like you said, the ambassador. Or maybe it's just, hey, we just want to, we just want to promote the sport. We want to grow the sport. We want to help local people, right? Maybe we want to represent something. Maybe, maybe there's a local company that you know we just want to bring attention to. Long story short, this is something as a coach you need to be thinking about. What's that identity? Am I going to let my players act and behave a particular way that may not represent the team identity or the culture? We talked about toxic players earlier, right? The cancer and how quickly that can ruin a team. When you've got a player who's pointing and pointing at everybody else and never looks in the mirror, that's toxicity. That's, that's bad. That's poison. And he's got to be cold. I don't care how good he is. I don't care if he's, he's shooting two guys off the break and he's, you know, he's, he's this incredible performer. I don't want to build a team around that. I don't want to build around a team a guy who's so selfish that he can't look in the mirror and say, I could have done better. That <coughs> one was on me. Right? Because just like Kobe, He's great because he made those around him great. He didn't drag those around him down, right? So team culture for me, from a personal perspective, is I want my guys to be accountable. And I want my guys to lift each other up, be positive, right? Now, when I say accountable and be positive, that doesn't mean that there isn't criticism. But it's got to be effective criticism the delivery has to be appropriate to where we talked earlier about communication and psychology, that the person understands why, right? Why we're, why we're being corrected, Watch your eyeballs. right? And something else I do with my guys, and, and Ryan touched on this, if I see a mistake made on the field, I don't come out and say, why did you do this, this, that, the other, blah, blah, blah. First thing I say is, hey, what were you thinking there? What was your thought process there? And the reason why I want to know this is because I want to know how he was playing the game, why he decided to do what he did, and if I can, that's now I have a base to start from, from a coaching perspective. I now have, I now understand that this guy was like, well, I was thinking, you know, the, the danger was on the cross and I saw the gun burst here and he this said, so I thought this was my line. I'm blind. Wow. I said, that hit me right in the eye. Watch your eyes. Watch your eyes. Um, so, right. And so now it's like, okay, I see where he was thinking. I see where he's coming from. Now I have a point of correction. I have a starting point where I can work with him I don't have to say, well, that was dumb. The danger wasn't on the cross. You know, okay. So, no, instead it was like, okay, well, maybe, do we consider this? Maybe next time we consider this. Let's look at it from this perspective. That's just me personally. That's how I deliver it, right? Ask um, lots of questions. The most lots of questions. Exactly. The most important question, and I want you to write this one down. If you write anything down, this is the one you write down. The most important question in paintball is why. Yeah. Why am I playing this guy in this position? Why am I sending a guy here on the break? Why am I turning a gun inside? Why do I want to be here during a close? Why do I play Daniel Camp on the second one-on-one -on -one against Infamous? Why do I, come on, I gave that one to you guys. That was a softball. Anyway, um, my Nobody point knew. is. Nobody <laughs> I thought it was a good call. Um, so why? And I know it seems simplistic, everyone, right? It, it's a, oh, come on. Coach, that's pretty simple. It's, it's, we complicate things. Paintball players will make this game so complicated that it will drive you up the wall, right? And sometimes we have to just dumb it down for them as a coach. As a coach, you need to manage that expectation for that player on what your expectations are. And so we ask why. Why do you want to do that? I love when my players come in and say, hey, coach, I want to try this. OK, try it. Why? Why do you want to try? Well, I think because, uh, you know, if we throw this rabbit out here, it'll draw the gun and I can go underneath. Let's do it. Let's see it. And then they do it and it doesn't work. I'm like, do it again. Because I'm not going to do it once. Give me some statistics. I really want to understand. And sometimes I'll even be a real jerk and go tell the other team, hey, he's going to do this. So 
right? <laughs> Stop it. The majority of the things that players will learn physically occur, occur over repetition, right? That's the easiest part of what we do. Getting a player physically to be able to do what we do is not the hard part. Getting them to mentally understand that if this, then that, listening, right, the input versus output during the communication process, and the speed in which all of those things need to occur, that's the hard part. The physical things are easy. That's why you can't give them the answer. They need to be able to answer your question quickly and play the whole tape. If a player moved out of a space, even sometimes if it's the right move, I say, hey, why'd you go there? Why'd you go? I want to know, was it luck? Was he just feeling it, went there? I want to know, did you go here to take a job from somebody else so that that player could then move to into different space, take a job back from you? I want the whole tape. Give me the whole thing. Don't just give me the three second version. I want to know why, right? As you get, especially with younger groups, it's not that complicated, right? You don't need the whole tape at that level. All you need to know is, did you understand where all the bodies were? Do you know how many of you are alive and where you are? You know what your guys are doing, right? And sometimes, especially in D5, usually what's your game plan? Go far. Go Speed kills. Go far. <laughs> speed right? kills. Go That's far. Right. As you go up the divisions, what happens? It slows down. It slows down. Right? Speed it slows down. Way. People start thinking through right. more things, right? They understand better. They anticipate where you're going to go, right? You have to slow down, right? But with D5, a lot of times, it is about the physical things. You're not yet to the mental part of the game. D4, you're starting to break into some of the simple parts of the game where you're questioning. You're making assumptions about where people are going off the break. You know, some things like that begin to get mental. Once you get D2 semi-pro, you're now anticipating well into the middle of the point what's going to happen. On a field layout like we just had, and Mike and I are pretty similar in this, we like to create a lot of choreography where we want to be able to tell a player, hey, I want you to go here, wait till this guy gets outside of you, then you're going to go underneath. Once you get to this space, now he's going to come up. There's a lot of choreography involved in a field layout like we just had. Very little choreography. So right, go, uh, go here, good luck. <laughs> right? God bless. You know? Godspeed. Hopefully right. you get there. Right? And if you get there, this is maybe what's going to happen, but it's also going to depend on where they go. Right? So you've got to understand all these if, this, then, that's, and those kind of things. We have about 10 minutes left, and I want to leave you guys with some space to ask questions, but I want to show you my itinerary uh, for one of our practices that we, we just had. And I want you to pay attention to where points are on this itinerary. Keep in mind, this is a professional team. Uh, the itinerary, and it's funny, Mike and I became friends because when I was coaching Austin Notorious, we had a practice together. <clears throat> we started talking about our process. They were very similar. And I had never seen another coach at that point that was prag as pragmatic as me, a little nerdy, right? Likes the process, and it's pretty similar each time. I make adjustments here and there. In fact, I'm going to show you one that I've made. I'm a big nerd. Yeah, so we realized that our processes were very similar, and we want... We want this, uh, this, uh, the same kind of end point. Our destination is the same, but our get there is a little different, right? right? <clears throat> our get there is a little different. But what we're trying to get content-wise is the same. Does that make sense? So we both kind of use it. Uh, in fact, I just kind of stole one of his and made it mine. Uh, I would just put it in note on my phone. Oh, where'd you go? No. That's all my passwords. <laughs> yeah, don't open that. I'm just kidding anyway. Uh, There's some behind the scenes oh, right the there. coaches show. Yeah, so this is. <laughs> as with all people. That's yeah, that's from Mike, by the way. <laughs> Stole that from him. Because I send this to, so another important thing when you get off the ranks, when you schedule a practice with another team, um, make sure they have a coach. Make sure they have a coach or at least some sort of manager or somebody that you can send your itinerary to that says, hey, yeah, this, is, this sounds good, right? Because if you show up and you have this itinerary and they realize, oh, shit, we're not playing you till tomorrow, they're going to be pissed, right? They're going to be pissed. So before I go practice another team, I make them aware, here's my schedule. Like, you may not love it. You may not love it. Do you guys see any points on day one? None. See, this is what is called foundational training, or what I call foundational training. 
basically, we're getting data, that we're creating hypotheses. We're walking the field. That's gonna go about an hour, hour and a half. We're walking the field and creating hypotheses. They're not theory yet. It's just a guess. We think it's gonna be like this, right? Warm up, you gotta put it in there for paint potting, right? Because I, I, I like to get like 80 to 120 pods potted up and ready to go so we can just work, okay? You're gonna start seeing scenario type stuff, okay? Bounce shots, on the break shots, island drills, these are all things, because the mind's the weapon, everyone. Paintball players, we all, all the markers do the same, right? So the mind's the weapon. And that's what we're, I wanted to talk about on top of what you were saying is that the mind is the weapon. I want to understand how he thinks <coughs> because the way he thinks is ultimately going to dictate how he plays. It's that simple. It's that simple. And that's what I also mean by knowing your players, right? Knowing what their strengths, weakness. You'll hear me talk about SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. That's S-W-O-T. You apply that to anything, you can fix it. So no points. You guys have any questions on this? Hit. We have a guy and then the group. Yeah, usually the team. No, they do. Oh, no, no. Oh, yeah. And that's, that's important because yeah, something no, as do. a coach, look for that. Look for that. If you see a player who's over here on his phone doing his Instagram going, you know, and then everyone else, you got the same four or five guys always helping, potting, and being it. That guy, got to make an example of him. If you don't put your phone down right now and start helping your teammate pod, we're going to have issues. Right? Now, you may not deliver it that way, and I don't normally deliver it that way. I'm usually like, hey, put your phone down and go help. Right? So it's that simple. But call that out. All right? Everyone pods. I want to touch on this really quick, communication flow. I, we, I like to identify, like, who are the first couple of people that are going to be talking. Yep. Right? One of the big mistakes I see, especially young teams make, is in the first 15 seconds of a point, there's all this output. Right? Nobody's hearing anything. <laughs> right. They're all just output, 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 and then they all stop at the same time and kind of look at each other and go, okay, what's happening? Because nobody heard anything. It's just output, output, output. So I like that the guys who can see outside of certain space, those are the first two guys talking. Did anybody make it outside of these two spots? That's important. You're talking first. And then the one guy whose responsibility is see the middle of the field, you're talking next, right? And then we'll put it together. Does that make right. sense? So it's not just all this output, output, output. I'm going to be working to build a program from scratch. Are you guys willing to share a sample agenda? Or anything? Uh, I'm, I'm going to say that at the end. Any of the stuff we want, uh, you, you can have it. Yeah, 100%. you can have it all. Yeah. So basically, you're saying your, your corners talk first. And then no. You nope. Talk no. 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 It depends. It, it's usually the inside guys. It's usually going to be two inside because guys. Because they're the ones shooting out. So here's the thing, right? guys. This is going to sound really. This is how your pros are so efficient on their processing speed off the break. They know immediately where they are not. You can send me a message, Rick. I'll send you all this stuff. Right? Because the first call, we don't break out and we sit there and, okay, you know, and you guys have codes and we'll just use some examples, right? You know, snake, delta, alpha, beta, shark, right? Hey, we got like That's three, five things. We got like three minutes. All right, stand by. That's five things, right? That's a lot of data. You got seven, how many people saying all that stuff? How about, you know, charger? Well, guess what? That just told me there's no one anywhere from this bunker over. All right, so that guy, like, he's one of the inside guys. He's shooting the gap. He's protecting wide. Hey, Charger. Next guy turns around and says, yeah, well, uh, Moonfall. Moonfall. Okay, well, there's no one here. So guess what that told me? It told me where in two locations no one are, is. So now we start the next step on identifying where they are. You can say a lot with one word. You can. You just got to figure out what's the most important for thing Efficiency. for you to know quickly and create some sort of one word code that you can say a lot of stuff, one word. We just say big. So we have big called a bunker name. We know whether there's nobody outside. It's an infamous thing. They've been doing it forever. We stole it, right? That's the other thing. Oh, I thought to be clear, <laughs> don't try to reinvent the wheel. Don't. You hear something you like, steal, steal it. Steal it. For the love of God, everybody in Texas uses calls that I created on X Factor in 2000, Texas Storm in 2002. So steal it. Steal it all. So again, where do you guys see points? Finally come in here, right? We played six per side, right? Um, and then as we get into Sunday, we start getting into real matches, except we start with mini matches. I put my guys into scenarios right away. So we'll play six minutes up down. What that means is you're up one, we're down one, there's six minutes left in the match. When you play points, 
What are you preparing for? Scenario. Nope. Mm -hmm. What? No. Nope. 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 When I play points, what am I? What, what point of the match am I preparing for? Clock. Nope. The first one. The very first one. The first point. one. When I play points, if that's all I do all weekend, all I've done is prepare my group to play the very first point of the match. That's it. That's it. I put no time on it. I've given them no intensity. I've not told them, hey, you're down one. We have three minutes, which means we have a decision to make. At some point during this point, if we shoot two guys off the break and there's one minute left, you're going to play for a tie. Do not leave enough space left for them to come score another point. You understand? If you're hot, you may say, eh, I feel good about a score in a 45 second point. We can go get two, right? But the players on the field have to be in these situations to understand when they get to the event, we have the decision. The coach doesn't have the decision to make. The players do. They're on the field, they see the clock, they have to make the decision. We're either gonna play for a tie, if we're down one, or if we're up one, it works the other way. Can I now go get one more point to help my margin? Or should I be okay with the one point win? It depends. If we've shot two guys off the break, what should we do? Let's go get a point, right? But what do we have to be careful of? Don't leave enough time left on the clock to play another point. Don't leave enough time left on the clock. I saw this yesterday in the semi-pro third and fourth game I was commentating. Young man goes from, uh, I'm not gonna say their name. You can go watch it if you want, it's on YouTube. He goes down, touches the buzzer, leaves 39 seconds left. You know what happened? His team got a major penalty. Major penalty. You know what happened the next point? They lost. 39 seconds. They lost two points in 39 seconds. It's rare. It's rare. But it can happen. But it's possible. Right? So you have to understand the situation. When we're going to go, we're going at 35 seconds. We're going at 38. Whatever your philosophy is and how fast you're going, whatever. Got to have a plan. Yeah. How do you kill the expectation of winning? You, if you're going to a tournament to win, your expectation's already bad. I'm going from five men to X-Ball yep. in May. Yep. And I don't think it's reasonable to expect to win our first X-Ball. It's not. It's not. I, no. How do I kill that without killing momentum and, you know, my Micro goals. If your goal, so it, it, let's, <laughs> let's talk about that really quick. You know how many teams were here? There were 199 X-Ball teams. 199, largest event ever not called World Cup, right? 199 teams, you know how many won? Seven. 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 So does that mean that 192 teams went home really angry? Maybe, maybe. If they did, they had inappropriate expectations. That's right. When I first started the Hurricanes and we first came to the pro division, I set four very simple goals. Our very first match our very first event, right? Win a point. No joke, it was that simple. Win a point. I didn't say win the first point. I didn't say win the third. I said win a point. Once we met that goal, hey guys, it's time for goal number two. Let's win two points. I know that sounds silly, but what I meant was let's win two points back to back, right? Goal number three, hey, let's win a match. Right? And goal number four, don't get last. It's that simple. And then my guys come out in 6-0 uprising, and I'm like, well, crap, we just met all four of our goals in the first match. So that was kind of, I didn't know where to go from there, but that's a good place to start, right? Manage the guy's expectations. Say, hey, let's win a point, guys. Let's focus on winning that one point, because ultimately it's one point at a time, right? So let's do that. Let's start there. I will tell you if you walk into an event and your only goal is to win, you will leave unhappy. You will leave very unhappy. You'll leave unhappy, right? Like, there's one team in the entire world of paintball that comes into every tournament they play with 100% expectation to win. There's one. I played them. And they deserve it. Yeah. They can feel that way. They're shocked when they don't win. They're shocked, right? And it makes sense for them. That's it. Every other team who's playing competitive paintball you have, if you don't set micro goals, attainable, difficult micro goals, you'll leave the reasonable. event unhappy. They have to be reasonable. You'll leave the event unhappy. Yeah, 100%. Right? You have to leave without crushing your group. If you leave an event, I will tell you, my group is pretty crushed right now. And they should be a little bit. They're a little crushed right now. 
But if we were playing divisional paintball, it would look different, right? The expectation would be different. I would set expectation differently coming into an event. When I coached Austin Notorious in D2, we had micro goals every step of the way. It wasn't we're going to go in and win every tournament. First of all, it had nothing to do with performance on the field because I was coaching them to be a professional team, not to be a Division II team. I didn't care if they won or lost the event. That wasn't the goal. For me, it was about perform. It was this stuff. It was this. This was what my, our goals were based around, was I want to be plus 12 at the end of the event, right? I want us to be plus 12 off the break at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the event, and I want us to have at least five perfect points. And what's a perfect point? It's not five, win it's not five guys alive at the end of the game. That's not a perfect point. A perfect point is everybody who was alive walks off and can play the entire tape to me. They can tell me where everybody was, who got shot from where, where their guys got shot from, and what job those guys were doing when they got shot. That's a perfect point. Perfect. Doesn't matter if there were five guys alive or not. Some people will walk off that got shot and thought they made a mistake. Don't rob the other guy who shot you who made a really good shot, maybe. Maybe you didn't make a mistake. They're really good, too, and their paintballs or bath beads are flying at 200 miles an hour. Can you repeat that list real quick? What, what they can tell you? Oh, Everything. Wants, I want them to play the tape. He wants to know what a Where the bodies point. were. Mm -hmm. Where we were. What the kill count was, meaning... If it was um, back left, middle back, back right, at what point did they get shot? Who, which one was the first kill, which was second, which was third, right? And then I want to know, when our guy came off of this, when he got shot out of that spot, what job was he on, who took it? That's a big one with me. If they can play the whole tape to me, yeah. great. By the way, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that just, it's all layout dependent. It is. It's layout dependent. It is. It makes sense? Yes, thank you. Okay. So this is my play call sheet. Everybody uses something different. Mike uses something different. SK has a really incredibly complicated thing that he uses that I really like too, but it's just way too complicated it's for me. Uh, I'm a little more old school, right? I, I still use a system like, but I literally like, if I start from this side, I circle, that's point one, right? And then I put whether we win or loss next to it, I put the time. And then in, on each space where there's a bunker, I put the player's initial, so I know who it is, and then I, I say what happened, right? By the way, shot out of spot, died out of the spot, and I know, I know that uh, that says field. So not, died on failed. break, died out of spot. Yeah, and that's failed job, not field job. Yeah. But nonetheless, died out of spot, like if my guys are getting shot out of their spot and it's five on two, I'm not, giving, I'm not squaring them for that. They're not going to get a square. Because at that point, you fight for your life, right? That's if we're five on five, four on four, three on three, and you die out of your spot, because I'm gonna yell at you, right? I'm gonna yell at you, especially if you're the guy on the island. I may shake you a little. Does that make sense? Real quick, let me, I wanna make a quick comment on that. That if I send a guy far and he gets shot on the break, whose fault is that? It's mine. By the, the way, it, it, it is 12.02. Um, if you have another class to go to and you need to step out, feel free. You're not gonna hurt our feelings. That is discipline. Selfish. No joke. We're legitimate. Then do it. Do it 100% because I'm trying to. We recognize that we are limitless. You gotta be a champion to become a champion, right? Winning is a habit because we create habits that lead to 